Hi, everyone. Um, so I think we are just a couple of minutes past noon, so we're going to get started. Um, so thank you so much all for joining us today and welcome to the Biome Seminar. My name is Shoko Yamada and I'm a third year doctoral student here at YSE as well as the Anthropology Department. And I'm a member of the Biome's organizing committee. Biome stands for Bridging Issues and Optimizing Methods in Environmental Science. It's our school's flagship seminar series hosted by the Dean's Office and facilitated by a committee of students and staff. The goal of the series is to bring cutting edge research and new ideas to the YSC community. I would like to remind everyone that Biomes is community sourced and that we are always accepting suggestions for future speakers. If you would like to suggest a speaker, you can either use um, our Google form through the QR code up here um, or just email us at biomes.yse at el.edu. For today's seminar, we are extremely fortunate to have Dr. Liz Kozlov from UCLA, who um, we are gonna introduce in a minute. After the talk, um, you will have a chance to ask questions during a short Q&A session. If you are attending in person, you can raise your hand and walk up to one of the mics in the front um, to ask your question. If you are attending on Zoom, you can submit your questions at any time to the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen or use use the raise hand function on Zoom and you will be given speaking privileges to ask questions live. Um, so with that, I'll now pass the floor to Katie McConnell, who is a PhD candidate here at YSC, and she'll be introducing today's speaker for us. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us both in person and remotely. Uh, my name is Katie McConnell, and I'm a fifth year PhD candidate here at YSC. And I'm really excited to welcome Dr. Liz Koslov as our speaker this week, who's joining us from the University of California, Los Angeles, where she's an assistant professor in the Department of Urban Planning, as well as with the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. Dr. Koslov holds a PhD in media, culture, and communication from New York University, and was a Mellon postdoctoral fellow in the humanities at MIT before starting at UCLA. To give a really brief bit of background, um, Dr. Koslov's 2016 article, The Case for Retreat, was one of the earliest texts to describe in ethnographic detail the idea of retreat or managed retreat of a community away from environmental hazards. And I'd really highly recommend reading this piece as it does a beautiful job of laying out both the politics of retreat as well as blending both historical and visual text with in-depth qualitative research. Dr. Koslov also has really fascinating writing on the idea of agnostic climate adaptation, the politics of FEMA flood mapping, and the role of sociology in the climate crisis. All to say, Dr. Koslov's work touches on various areas of study that are really core to YSE, climate change, environmental policy, and people equity in the environment. So we're really excited to have her with us today. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Let me share my screen here. Okay. Can you all see my slides in the room? I can see you. So if you wave, I'll know you can see my slides. <laughs> all right. Hi. Nice to see you. You're small on my screen, but hopefully I'm not too big on yours. Um, thank you so much, Katie, for that introduction. Thank you, Shoko. Thanks to everyone who had a hand in inviting me to be here, here um, on your screen with you today. Um, and for inviting me to share my work and giving me this opportunity. I'm just thrilled to, to present work to you and I'm really excited for our conversation and I'm hoping to save quite a bit of time for, for Q&A, for discussion, um, because what I'm going to present today is still really very much a work in progress, um, although I've been working on it, as, as Katie mentioned, for what feels like a really long time and is a pretty long time. Um, that's, that's one of the reasons why I it kind of felt apt to use this picture as my opening slide. Um, full disclosure, I'm very, I feel very in the weeds at the moment, just in my own writing process and working on this topic. Um, I'm, I'm just returning from, from parental leave, trying to come back to writing this book. And this is all sort of going to be an experiment and, and talking through some, some slightly different material in a different way than, than I often do. Um, so the weeds here, just to be to be fair to them, many people call them weeds, but they're technically called Phragmites. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with them. They're they're kind of a hallmark of a lot of landscapes along along the Northeast and other parts of the country. Um, 
And I took this picture, I spent quite a bit of time amidst them during my field work. Uh, I took this picture probably five or six years ago now on the east shore of Staten Island in New York City. Uh, this is probably not the landscape you immediately think of when you think of New York, but it's very much of the city. Phragmites are a social species, one that, quote, thrives in disturbed landscapes, as environmental historian Ted Steinberg has put it. Um, the, the sense I get is they're kind of like, I'm not an ecologist or environmental scientist, so don't quote me on this, but they're kind of like the seagulls of grass or something. Um, they're very tough, they're kind of essentially impenetrable, and they can grow 15 to 20 feet high. Uh, you can see for scale some, some of my former students walking through them, and on the right is my mom. The, the presence of Phragmites marks some of Staten Island's last remaining wetlands. Walking along barely paved streets beside them can evoke the feeling of a timeless realm outside the crush of the city, though it's really, of course, no such thing. No last bastion marking the limit of human encroachment on the coast, but a sign of how thoroughly inextricable the natural and social truly are. Coastal edges, already landscapes, thoroughly shaped, constructed, and, and deconstructed in society's image in tandem with biophysical processes. I like Phragmites in part because even though they can invoke, evoke persistent nature society divides, they also disrupt them. And in part because it feels like people really generally either love to hate on them or just dismiss them. Not, not unlike Staten Island for that matter. Um, Phragmites are what ecologist Kristen Saltonstall has called a cryptic invader, a species that cannot easily be classified as native or introduced. Though they're usually considered invasive, ideally eradicated, a source of threat themselves, rather than a manifestation of the forces and dynamics that have produced the disturbed landscapes in which they take root and seek to survive. So that's, that's the end of my extended Phragmites metaphor for what I'm going to talk about today, which is, as, as Katie mentioned, managed retreat, the focus of a lot of my work. Um, managed retreat is typically understood as the process of moving out of harm's way, out of the path of environmental hazards made all the more unmanageable by climate change. And I came to Staten Island because it was the site of managed retreat after Hurricane Sandy, when New York State offered home buyouts to hundreds of property owners, paying them pre-storm value to sell their houses to the government on the condition that these houses would be demolished and the land returned, in then Governor Cuomo's words, to Mother Nature, never to be built on again. I spent four years closely following the buyout process as it unfolded, spending time on Staten Island and conducting dozens of interviews with residents, community leaders, planners, and officials, working to understand how what is still an unusual and highly controversial response to disaster came about, the diverse meetings that it held for those involved, and the consequences that such policies and programs might have, given that retreat is increasingly acknowledged, albeit ambivalently, as necessary, at least for some people and places in the face of climate change. And so in the first part of today's talk, I'll say just a bit about retreat and some of the challenges that it poses conceptually and practically, not least grappling with the legacies of racialized possession and dispossession that organize the landscapes we inhabit today. Then I'll take you to Staten Island and describe how one seemingly unlikely community came to embrace retreat, effectively organizing to disperse themselves by lobbying for buyouts. And, and I think this story offers an important and to, to some extent a successful example of community-based climate adaptation, um, but it's also in many ways a cautionary tale, uh, something that is ambiguous, ambivalent, and compromised, like a Phragmites. So part one. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about managed retreat, starting with the term itself. The term managed retreat, as far as I've been able to, to glean, initially referred primarily to managing environments, specifically coastlines. So when a shoreline retreats due to erosion or sea level rise, one option is to manage that retreat, allowing space for it to occur rather than attempting to prevent it. In the context of climate change and development patterns that have produced denser and more urbanized coastlines, Managed retreat has come to refer more broadly to managing the movement of people, communities, buildings, and infrastructure out of all manner of existing or potential hazard zones. 
Among climate adaptation practitioners, retreat is often presented as one of several strategies to respond to flooding, as in this image here from a report of the IPCC Coastal Zone Management Subgroup. And, and this image is from way back in 1990. So you can see, <laughs> 1990 still feels close, um, but you can see that retreat has been conceived as a potential option for quite some time, uh, though in practice, it's typically still viewed as a last resort. Even just broaching the idea of planning for possible retreat at some future point can be a non-starter, as in the Southern California city of Del Mar, which remains in a standoff with the State Coastal Commission over the commission's urging that coastal cities in California address retreat as a potential response to sea level rise. In cities and property markets long conceptualized in terms of growth, Retreat and retreat planning are perceived as a threat, a threat to property values, to private property rights, and to the property tax base that allows many governments to continue to function to sustain themselves, infrastructure, and services for broader communities. There's lots of political power in wealthier, more privileged communities to ward off the threat of retreat. And places like this have long benefited and are likely to continue to do so from investments of public resources that enable them to remain in place and minimize the risks that accompany residents in dangerous but desirable locales. Geographer Tim Collins has written about this dynamic and there's, there's the classic Mike Davis piece, The Case for Letting Malibu Burn. In marginalized communities, conversely, many of whom live in marginal lands and spaces made all the more hazardous through pollution, extraction and disinvestment, Retreat can represent a new chapter in an ongoing story of serial dispossession, connected to what my colleague Ananya Roy has theorized as racial banishment, quote, state instituted violence against racialized bodies and communities. In post Katrina New Orleans, when the local newspaper reported that some planners and officials were proposing to shrink the footprint of the city by converting some predominantly black neighborhoods to parkland and incited an uproar. And though this, this particular vision didn't come to pass, the patterns of rebuilding and demolition, including of undamaged public housing, patterns of who was displaced and who could remain or return, still very much accorded with existing market-driven disaster recovery and urban development logics that contributed to whitening and privatizing the city, perpetuating and deepening its racialized divides, um, but now increasingly in the name of climate change adaptation and resilience. When Hurricane Sandy hit New York in 2012, I was living there working on my PhD at NYU. I'd been writing about experiences of eviction, anti-displacement activism and housing rights and housing justice in relation to conflicts over everyday sorts of urban redevelopment. Um, you know, I knew next to nothing about disasters, climate change, the environment. I hadn't, hadn't taken kind of related classes, but you know, reading op-eds like this one by coastal geologist Oren Pilkey, um, you know, as, as op-eds like this appeared in the paper, kind of in the weeks after Sandy, and I came across the term managed retreat, which to me sounded pretty dystopian and, and reminiscent of managed decline and planned shrinkage. And these policies whose politics and lived effects I'd been studying, I was curious to see if there were places where retreat would be proposed in the city and what the ensuing debates would be. So, before I take you with me to Staten Island, I'll just pause for a moment on this image that accompanied Dr. Pilkey's op-ed because I think it's really telling. Um, it reflects several dominant tendencies in how we think and forge policy around retreat at present. And retreat is primarily enacted now by means of buyouts, this, this tool that people were arguing for in Staten Island. And so we, we tend to think about retreat and buyouts, firstly, as a response to proximate natural quote unquote, natural, naturalized hazards, flood, fire, storms, you know, you can see in this image, the kind of blowing hurricane personified and the waves and the wind. Uh, we, it's, it's very focused on property, particularly an idealized owner occupied single family home, um, at least as much if not more so than on people like in this image. And also we think about it as individual action or it's sort of policy is geared towards retreat as individual action, disconnected from communities and social context. And we can see some of the issues that these tendencies raise, what they include, whom they exclude through the story of buyouts in Staten Island, a place which is really at the intersection of environmental privilege and precariousness. No, oh, two. When I decided I wanted to study debates over retreat in post Sandy New York City, I went to Staten Island, although in many ways it, it might seem like an unlikely site. 
in the context of the city, Staten Island's an outlier. It's an outlier geographically, politically, socially. Um, I'd imagine, you know, I'm, I've been in California now, not everybody knows Staten Island, but, but probably many of you are familiar. Maybe maybe some of you have connections there from there. Um, but it's, it's known for being the so-called forgotten borough on the fringes of urban space, closer to New Jersey than Manhattan. It's the only majority white borough in the city, largely middle class and politically conservative, dominated by more suburban style, single family homes, lawns, drivers. Um, I don't have a driver's license. It was tricky to navigate during my field work. Um, it's, it's vast. It's three times the land area of Manhattan, despite its shrunken depiction down in the corner of the city's subway maps. But like US coastal areas more broadly, it's rapidly growing denser, more diverse and more unequal. And it was also by a number of measures, one of the hardest hit boroughs by Sandy, whose lines of damage didn't map neatly onto the city's racial and class divides. The area that's, that's kind of outlined here on the map, the East and South shores, saw the highest water levels in the city and the most deaths along with widespread housing damage. And finally, and most critically for my own purposes, as I mentioned, shortly after Sandy, Staten Island became the site of a pilot home buyout program, a New York state program that offered homeowners in one target neighborhood, a portion of one target neighborhood, Oakwood Beach, pre-storm value for their damaged houses, plus a set of bonus incentives intended to encourage collective uptake and enable people to relocate nearby with the aim of demolishing a substantial portion of the neighborhood and returning the land to some kind of natural open space as a buffer to help protect against future flooding and storm surge. And so in this way, for me, Staten Island presented an opportunity to study managed retreat from inception all the way through implementation. And my research was primarily ethnographic, which enabled me to follow the process as it unfolded, to be there as people were discussing whether to stay or to go, and to understand the meaning and lived experience of retreat for those involved. I spent countless hours speaking with residents, periods of time living in neighborhoods on the East Shore and observing daily life in affected neighborhoods, attending community meetings, events, protests. I conducted more than 60 in-depth interviews to gain a deeper understanding of retreat from multiple vantage points. I also tried to conduct as many follow-up interviews as I could to track people's views and experiences over time. I analyzed media coverage and cultural production, including artwork, poetry, memoirs, and photographs portraying life on Staten Island before and after the storm. Taken together, this research enabled me to understand how retreat came to mean something very different in Staten Island than it did for many elected officials, policymakers, and people in other parts of the city at the time, and, and something very different from what I'd expected myself. If my prevailing understanding of managed retreat was as something akin to displacement or forced relocation, a top-down government intervention that was bound to be resisted, particularly in what was by all accounts a pretty anti-government part of the city, I was quickly surprised. My first visit to Staten Island was to attend a community meeting held at a church in Oakwood Heights in early March 2013, just about four months after the storm. I remember heading down the steps into the church basement, the room that you see pictured here expecting an antagonistic atmosphere. But what I found instead were dozens of people, mostly white, middle-aged and older, talking amongst themselves with some enthusiasm, it seemed, about the possibility of being bought out, about how blessed they were that Governor Cuomo was prepared to support such an initiative. The vast majority of attendees, including the meeting's organizer, did not live in Oakwood Beach, but in surrounding neighborhoods that were not yet eligible for buyouts, but hoped they soon would be. Though there were local government representatives present, the meeting's first speaker here, Joe Tyrone, was a man who was himself part of the Oakwood Beach buyout, which had been announced just a few weeks before. The state's pilot program, he explained, only came about as the result of intensive grassroots action. If those in the room wanted buyouts too, he said, they would need to get organized, form a local neighborhood committee, and educate, not intimidate, any neighbors who might be holdouts. The aim being to assemble so-called natural clusters of homes that would be appealing and viable candidates for the state's program. People listened. Over the coming weeks and months I followed as residents formed buyout groups in neighborhoods up and down the shore, stretching from South Beach to Lower Tottenville, petitioning state officials to expand the program to include them too. Um, you can see a couple of pictures I took of, of signs. One of them says, Governor Cuomo, desperate, will work for buyout, Crescent Beach Buyout Committee. Another uh, sign says, Governor Cuomo, Mother Nature wants her land back. Buy us out and give it back. Uh, 
this is signed by a man who put signs all around his house asking for a buyout in Graham Beach. Another says, Governor Cuomo, ocean breeze needs your buyout. And then there's a photo from the Staten Island Advance, the local newspaper, um, of a demonstration in South Beach. One of the signs says, Governor Cuomo, senior, sick, tired, broke, buy me out, please. As someone more used to studying how people come together to protect their communities and preserve the places where they live, this seemed like a paradoxical kind of mobilization. Communities, as I said, organizing to disperse themselves and to demolish places that some had called home for generations. I wanted to understand first and foremost what was motivating these desires and demands for buyouts, what they meant to those involved. To the extent that buyouts and managed retreat are predominantly framed as responses to flooding and, and increasingly as a way of adapting to climate threats, climate change seemed like an obvious answer. And it's something that I initially expected to be pretty central to people's deliberations, particularly given that Sandy was widely being spoken about um, in national media, city media, by city politicians and public officials as a sign of what to expect with worsening warming. I soon discovered, however, that climate change was, for the most part, not something being spoken about in meetings that I attended or by the people I met in Staten Island, a number of whom, when I eventually broached the topic, um, said to me that they did not believe in it and did not necessarily think a storm like Sandy even would happen again. As I mentioned, it's a politically conservative area where the majority of voters would go on to support Donald Trump in both presidential elections. But when I asked, I did encounter people who privately at least expressed a diverse range of views. What they shared was a sense that climate change could be a very polarizing topic, the kind of divisive subject that it wouldn't be expedient to bring up at a time when the aim was to garner neighborhood-wide consensus in support of buyouts. What people needed was a more unifying narrative. Um, I've written about this at greater length in, in the article that Katie mentioned on agnostic adaptation, a term coined by legal theorist Katrina cue to describe the phenomenon of adapting to the effects of climate change without acknowledging climate change as a cause or working to mitigate it. So elements of this, this more unifying narrative lay in the past and people's shared history and common understanding of what had brought them to the shore in the first place and the forces that contributed to producing the vulnerability they now faced. This is a picture that a man from Ocean Breeze showed me of how his neighborhood used to look back when creeks flowed in and out between the houses, which were set up on pilings in the marsh, docks serving to connect them. Excuse me, it's early here, so I'm still drinking my coffee. Uh, an older woman I met who has since passed away told me stories of her grandmother catching crabs and eels for dinner right from the porch, how she used to swim where water no longer flows. A neighbor told me how people would canoe through the creeks on summer nights, stopping off at everybody's little fishing docks, docks like the landscape in this photo that are now just a memory. As one Graham Beach woman explained to me, quote, over the years, the city allowed development and they allowed them to fill in the creeks and the wetlands and build on them. So now the water is a problem because it doesn't have its natural places to go anymore. These houses that were built down here in 1917 are the ones that they've decided need to be bought out because it's a problem, the flooding. They allowed the building. The building happened between the 70s and the 90s. Oh, those are not the problem. We are. I know in my head that I should be grateful that they're offering to buy us out and get us out of this situation. But a big part of me says they did this. This is a problem that was created. Now, this was a, this was a unifying narrative, and it's a story I heard time and again, highlighting government failures and culpability in ways that help justify people's demands for, for intervention now and sort of helped them feel, I think, more okay and yeah, more justified in asking for it given their kind of more conservative and libertarian politics. It highlighted the idea of retreat as something that was about righting a past wrong and restoring a collectively remembered landscape and highlighted very real histories, forces, and generations of local activism focused on flooding. That a sole focus on impending climate change um, threatened to obscure and, and this kind of really primary focus on climate change was pretty common for, for the city's political elite, like Mayor Michael Bloomberg, who could be eager to talk about how such flooding was you know, a novel problem, something like the effects of Sandy that were unforeseen for which it would have been near impossible to be adequately forewarned or prepared, uh, caused by forces largely outside their own control. 
And, and this didn't sit well with residents who for decades had been trying to draw attention to the problems of worsening flooding in their neighborhoods. Neighborhoods that used to be fluid landscapes are now cut off from the water and can feel removed from the ocean, set back from, and in some cases below, built up beaches and surrounding roadways, like Father Capitano Boulevard, a Robert Moses era highway that divides much of the East shore from the ocean. Father Cap is raised about 10 feet above sea level. And when the water rose during Sandy, it overtopped the road, filling up the streets behind it, which residents call the bowl, very suddenly leaving people very little time to escape and some could not. And this was the area with the highest concentration of deaths in the city. And this is one problem with so-called hard flood defenses. When they fail, they fail catastrophically. With levees and seawalls, they may also contribute to a false sense of security and even encourage more development in the floodplain. Even when they succeed, they still have, of course, vast environmental impacts, not to mention contributing to erosion downstream or along the beach and potentially displacing water somewhere else. For thousands of years, the native Lenape inhabitants of what's now called Staten Island practiced seasonal settlement and agriculture, moving every few months in ways that cultivated and sustained the capacity and biodiversity of the land, water, and intertidal zone, while also being adaptive to seasonal weather patterns. Colonization, as we know, entailed a violent severing and erasure of these relations, an expulsion of most surviving Lenape peoples far from their homelands, with present federally recognized Lenape nations in Oklahoma and Wisconsin, as well as Canada, along with state recognized tribes and others still fighting for recognition. And it's important to note that a lack of federal recognition is a key obstacle now for a number of tribes fighting for funding to support community led relocation efforts from lands where they were forcibly settled or forced to flee. Anthropologist Julie Maldonado has written an incredible book about this called Seeking Justice in an Energy Sacrifice Zone, focused on Ilda Jean Charles in Louisiana. Historians have written about the land reclamation and filling of water to build out, build out New York City's coastline, like that of many other cities that accompanied colonial development. But by the date of this map in 1900, just two years after Staten Island officially became part of New York City, we can see that still much of the East Shore had not yet been rendered solid ground, though this was starting to change. Staten Island's beaches had become popular resorts, and private companies had begun buying up and filling underwater land, building piers and amusements, and renting out thousands of beachside bungalows to vacationers. So-called bungalow colonies, clusters of tents and small wooden dwellings, were erected all along the shore through the 20s and 30s, and mark the wave of development to which many of those I met trace their roots. I heard numerous stories of people's parents and grandparents, usually Italian, sometimes Irish immigrants, coming to Staten Island's beaches to escape the heat of Manhattan neighborhoods like Harlem and Hell's Kitchen. That was vacation, you know, a lifelong Staten Islander and editor at the local paper told me. My uncle was a carpenter from Italy, ended up building a house in a neighborhood not far from the beach when my family moved out. An organizer of the Graham Beach buyout group told me how his grandparents emigrated from Italy with his mother growing up in Brooklyn, his father on the Lower East Side, finally meeting and falling in love on Staten Island. They met in summertime, he said, which a lot of people did because the whole area was a summer retreat. They came out here and the rest is history. Many of those who came to Staten Island's shore over the middle parts of the century were seeking a retreat, a place they could visit and sometimes stay on the outskirts of the city, free from interference. At first, most inhabitants were seasonal, but by the middle of the century, post-war housing shortage contributed to more and more people moving to the shore full time, winterizing beach bungalows by converting them for year-round use. This provided a much needed source of affordable housing, but exposed residents to the brunt of storm season. Sandy did disproportionate damage. Let's see, I get messed up the order of my slides, but it'll, it'll make sense. Sandy did disproportionate damage to bungalow style housing which was constructed prior to current building standards and codes, part of what's kept it affordable. And it continues to be a dominant housing type on the East Shore and a popular one, given that the kind of economic pressures that drove people to winterize bungalows initially have only grown more severe. Although bungalows are often depicted as anachronistic and naturally, quote unquote, vulnerable to flooding, and in some ways they are, in the decades leading up to Sandy, their exposure was worsened by subsequent waves of new development around them. At the time when the Homeowners Loan Corporation was creating its now infamous redlining maps, 
Assessors noted that shorefront neighborhoods were on the decline and likely to remain so, as cheap summer communities only liked by Italians with low grade building stock and inadequate or lacking public infrastructure. Staten Island's more desirable neighborhoods, the wealthiest to this day, were concentrated on higher ground in the middle of the island, where the glacial retreat during the Ice Age left a ridge of rubble that forms the highest natural point on the eastern seaboard south of Maine, Tote Hill, site of the house from the Godfather movie, along with other notable mansions. People who grew up below the boulevard, uh, the phrase that refers to Highland Boulevard running the length of the island a short ways inland, shared childhood memories of being called swamp kids or weed people. Nobody wanted to know from you, one woman told me, but it was a different time. It was quiet. We had woods in the back. We used to build tree houses. Nobody bothered us. That would change with the construction of the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, which opened in 1964, connecting Staten Island to Brooklyn, and by extension, the rest of New York City, until then accessible only by ferry. The bridge marked a turning point, to the extent that it's common still in Staten Island to divide residents into before the bridge people and after the bridge people. After the bridge people included many who moved over from Brooklyn and other parts of the city, contributing to a boom in population in Staten Island when numbers were falling in other boroughs. It was an era of suburbanization and white flight, which some consider a major driver of growth along the shore. As one participant in the Ocean Breeze buyout said to me, quote, people moved here for a particular reason, maybe for a pure reason, they wanted a bigger, better school for their kids and a little bit more backyard. But they also moved here because they didn't want the black family that just moved next door to them in Bushwick or the Hispanic family or the Asian or whoever the hell they might be. That's why they came here. Others narrated moving over the bridge as a process of becoming white, of escaping the quote unquote Italian ghetto of neighborhoods like Red Hook and assimilating by means of the American dream of homeownership, albeit partially and provisionally to the extent that Staten Island still carries some racialized stereotypes and stigma. Yet those who settled on the shore were white enough to benefit from racist policies that enabled and subsidized white homeownership, able to take advantage of mid-century housing construction that remained off limits to African-Americans, segregated in Staten Island along the North Shore, site of one of the highest concentrations of dangerously polluted Superfund sites in the country, and segregated by the Staten Island Expressway, which accompanied the opening of the bridge, and which some call Staten Island's Mason-Dixon line and by housing discrimination that persisted long after it was officially made illegal. This is a photo from the local paper showing the aftermath of a 1972 arson attack on an East Shore home the day before a Black family was set to move in. This history, while another divisive topic subject to near blanket silence over the course of my field work, was a condition of possibility for buyouts, for the people that demanded them to become homeowners in the first place, who had a chance of getting bought out and exercising at least some agency over the process after Sandy. In the run up to the storm, development on the shore grew more high end and upscale, as with many other waterfronts nationwide. If many of those I spoke to described moving over because it was affordable, um, but had ceased by that point viewing beaches as a major draw. The resorts, you know, after the bridge had opened, the resorts were long gone. The 70s fiscal crisis had left them littered with waste, and some remain to this day sparsely populated and difficult to access, like the beach in Oakwood Beach, which requires kind of cutting through overgrown shrubbery and brambles. But more recently, parts of the swamps had begun to become seen as an amenity. And this created new divides and new vulnerabilities. This picture shows a man, Alex Dubrovsky, standing on the right in the backyard of his bungalow, which now abutted a development of luxury townhouses called Sailor's Key that you can see behind him. The townhouses are elevated, built up on filled land, and surrounded by a wall that Alex started calling the wrong way seawall after Sandy, because he blamed it for displacing the surge onto his own street of older, smaller bungalows, destroying them in the process of protecting his new neighbors. He went on to organize the Crescent Beach Bio Committee. Other neighborhoods held similar stories like Oakwood Beach, where blocks of attached townhouses were controversially erected in the path of a planned levee system after a damaging 1992 nor'easter and blamed by some after Hurricane Sandy for the deaths in the neighborhood's adjacent bungalows, with the damage rumored to have occurred on the inland side where water displaced from these buildings might have been pushed. Residents in these homes, these homes pictured here, the, the newer townhouses, they also suffered damage, albeit less, vis less visible, 
but were excluded from the initial organizing by their neighbors buyout committee. Once the pilot deal came through for those houses, organizers went on to support their petition, and, and these houses too eventually became part of an expanded Oakwood Beach buyout area, though adjacent blocks of severely damaged homes outside the bound, remained outside the bounds, despite residents' persistence and pleas. So rather than focus on the experience and outcomes of the buyout and recovery process itself, which makes up the bulk of my book and quite a lot of my prior talks. I focused here on the longer backstory that set the stage for the push to retreat post Sandy, that produced the shore as both a place where people were and could conceive of themselves as at risk. Not least from looming government actions like rising flood insurance rates and enforced elevation and building codes, um, but also from neighborhood change, both of the gentrifying sort and fears of decline, anxieties projected onto the rising population of new immigrants, many from Central America, many who were renters, living in the kind of off the books apartments that proved so deadly recently during Hurricane Ida, and which the state resisted buying out after Hurricane Sandy, in part because the funds and the choice to participate wouldn't have gone to tenants, but their landlords, and in part because state officials did not want their program to be or be perceived as a form of slum, slum clearance. They also didn't want it to be perceived as a bailout of the wealthy and so resisted buying out neighborhoods where there were more of these kind of bigger uh, waterfront houses and mansions interspersed with the remaining bungalows, many of whose residents wanted buyouts. Other chapters of the book delve in greater detail into the dynamics and mechanics of the organizing process and importantly the contradictory government response that followed as New York City rejected talk of retreat, proposing to acquire the land of willing sellers for redevelopment instead of a return to nature. While New York State, initially supportive, wound up admitting only a very small fraction of those who sought buyouts into its program, portions of just two additional neighborhoods, Ocean Breeze and Grand Beach. The demand for buyouts, fierce debates that followed, and eventual buyout boundaries cannot be explained solely by Sandy's lines of damage or by the imperative to adapt to climate change. Where and how retreat plays out is as much a product of social geography as physical geography. And the two are all the more inextricable the closer one looks. Landscapes taken as natural, as baselines, as geographer Kimberly Thomas reminds us, are always already shaped and reshaped, often dramatically, by social forces and human intervention, primarily by those with the power to meld and make use of the land and shore to their ends, erasing in the process alternative ways of being and living in and with these dynamic spaces and when one, with one another. Which brings us back to the Phragmites. As one Oakwood Beach buyout organizer stressed to me, you need to go back to really understand why we are pursuing a buyout. The history to it really brings us to where we are today and why. I hope I've given you a sense of some of the ways that this is the case, that history matters, despite the tendency in some climate adaptation conversations to focus on projections of future risk, rather than how that risk and the discrepancies and who and where it affects and is going to affect have come to be to manage and bound retreat by focusing only on factors like elevation, proximity to the coast or repetitive flooding without acknowledging how climate change is being produced and exacerbated by the same forces that render some people in places more vulnerable and others relatively secure in the face of its effects is bound to reproduce inequality and generate new inequities and forms of insecurity in the process. To counter this tendency in what Dean Hardy and colleagues have called colorblind adaptation, I'd argue can only happen if we make a shift from conceiving of retreat as moving out of harm's way to thinking of it as about retreating from ways of life, retreating from and dismantling the systems that produce such harms in the first place. Thank you. So I think Shoko is handling questions. Shoko, are you there? There she is. Hi, um, is this on now? Yep, I can hear you just fine. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Kozla, for this really wonderful and um, fascinating talk. Um, so we're going to now move on to the Q&A session. Um, just as a reminder, um, if you are attending 
in person, you can raise your hand and I'm gonna call on people so you can walk up to one of the mics in the front. And if you are attending on Zoom, um, you can either raise your Zoom hand or um, type your questions in the Q&A box in the, on, um, on Zoom. Um, so if you have a question, um, please go ahead. But we do, maybe we can start with um, a question that already came in to the Zoom Q&A box. So I'm just gonna read this. Um, so this is a question from Liana. Um, how did you choose the people to interview for this project? Um, are there any limitations to the ethnographic approach for this kind of project? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so it was pretty much a case of kind of snowball sampling in some sense. I mean, I was first concerned to, and, and kind of throughout the process, really concerned to interview as many residents as I could in these neighborhoods, in part because they were in the process of maybe moving away. And so it felt kind of pressing to, to meet them and get their stories and, and get to know them while they were still in Staten Island. Um, so, you know, people I would just meet at community meetings, you know, walking down the street, if I saw someone in their yard, often, you know, there aren't that many pedestrians in these neighborhoods. And so someone might see me out their window and say, are you lost? And I would say, no, you know, can I talk to you? And so just kind of trying to meet as many people as I could, you know, both talking to sort of the, the community leaders and, and maybe more dominant voices in the neighborhood who were kind of the, the greeters and would tell you how it is, but also trying to talk to people who maybe weren't attending the meetings and, and who I wouldn't otherwise as easily encounter. And as I mentioned, I was really trying to use interviews as a way to access different kinds of vantage points on the process. So trying to meet tenants as well as homeowners, meet people who weren't necessarily part of the buyouts, but lived in adjacent areas and, you know, just understand really broadly experiences of Sandy in this part of Staten Island and the recovery process. And so, you know, when it came to talking to city, state, and local officials, you know, I was a grad student, so there was sort of a limit in the number of people who would email me back and talk to me. So I talked to, you know, as many people as I could. I think this connects to like the limits, both the, you know, sort of affordances and the limitations of an ethnographic approach is you, you know, you get a ton of really rich material. Um, you know, I just have this enormous archive of thousands and thousands of pages of, of transcripts and field notes and, and all of that kind of tracking my own experiences. And I think that is really crucial for this kind of project because a lot of the, the studies, particularly of retreat and buyouts, you know, are sort of these surveys that try to determine, you know, what makes people decide whether to stay or go and what accounts for these preferences. But what I could see during the field work is how much people's minds changed and changed and changed again over time, how from one day to the next, they'd be like, I'm going, I'm not going, I want to stay and I want to go. And just the ambivalence of that and the way, you know, I might ask the question and they'd say, well, let's talk to the neighbors, let's see what they're thinking of doing today. And just how it was really, you know, a process, it was a long process and there was so much work that even went into getting to the point where that decision was possible to make, where people even had an option and most people never wound up with that option. The limitations were that, you know, you get very deep into a particular area in a particular context and it's hard to understand how it fits in relation to what's happening elsewhere and to understand, you know, whether the dynamics I observed in Staten Island were also present in other cases, how they were different. And it, you know, I wanted to be doing field work in other kind of similar parts of New York City where there wasn't a push for buyouts, but it was just you know, not feasible. Um, and so it's been really helpful kind of in the time it's taken me to write this book that there are now so many other people working on these questions and in other places and people doing really amazing kind of quantitative analyses of like the patterns in all the buyouts that have happened, you know, like 40 some thousand FEMA funded buyouts nationwide. And I can start to understand in what ways is the Staten Island case exceptional or kind of more illustrative of general patterns. And so that's you know, I think it's it's essential to kind of have that community of, of thinkers to engage with as an ethnographer. Um, thank you. Oh, so I think we have one question from the in-person audience. Um, so we're gonna, yeah, you can, yeah, you walk up to, yeah, we're gonna let him go. That's all right. And then after that, there's, an, there's a question from the Zoom audience. Okay. Um. Hi, Professor Kozlov, thanks for coming. Um, I'm a big fan of your work, and I know that in your work you've talked um, kind of at length about the, the sort of language that we use to talk about retreat and kind of tying that into sort of, um, I guess, militarization of the term retreat. And when I read that, I think a lot about kind of just like the inherent kind of Americanness 
of that. And I was hoping you could comment a little bit about that type of language and whether you see that as a particularly American thing or, you know, as someone with your finger on the pulse, I'm sure of retreat more generally, globally, um, kind of how you see that playing out, not only domestically, but kind of abroad as well. Thanks so much for that question. That is a really open question for me. It's just what terms are being used and kind of contested in other other parts of the world. I don't know. Um, you know, I don't know if they hold the same, you know, negative resonances that that retreat is often taken to have here in the US. And, and definitely that, you know, I think it's very fair to say retreat is explicitly you know seen as anti-american i've heard it referred to as anti-american it's kind of the opposite of manifest destiny and you know and incites all kinds of anxieties for that reason i was listening to a really interesting um online uh, coastal commission hearing in california where they were talking about you know these retreat debates and kind of wanting to wanting to encourage it and they were saying you know the term a lot of people who who do favor um, forms of retreat are, are like, well, we just need to think of like the right language because retreat, people don't like it, it rhymes with defeat. And, and one of the members in the Coastal Commission hearing said, you know, you know as we're talking about how it's seen as anti-American, he was like, we need to call it like freedom retreat. Like that's what we have to call it, you know, or just find some way to make it sound American. And I was like, this is very striking. Um, but yeah, I think I've written and talked about how, you know, when I when I first was hearing the term managed retreat, it was often kind of counterposed, you know, you can either retreat from flooding or you can defend or you can attack. And attack means you build even farther out onto the water. That's the approach that kind of the, the mayoral administrations in New York City favored, you know, building even more land out into the East River and, and really that attack approach and then defend is, you know, constructing, you know, it's the Army Corps of Engineers who does it. So, you know, constructing all of these big defenses and then retreat is the kind of like, Oh yeah, no, you don't, you don't do that. That's kind of the, the last resort thing. And, and you see the term now that more ascendant strategic retreat. I think there's a lot of ways of trying to make retreat seem like palatable, but the reason I kind of like the term retreat and am a contrary. And I think in that respect is that I think uh, the, the kinds of forces and ideologies of growth and progress and conquest that make retreat seem unpalatable are exactly the things that we should not be embracing. And so to the extent that retreat and the language of retreat poses a threat to that, I, I like it. Um, next, we have a question from um, one of the Zoom audience members. Um, he says, wonderful talk, a follow up on the considerations and ambivalence you just mentioned. I think this is referring to um, your answer to the previous question. Um, were there any interesting differences observed in how folks viewed their identity as New Yorkers across the individuals or groups you may interviewed? Um, was there any sense in which disparate ideas or evaluations of civic pride affected individuals' attitudes towards retreat? Mm, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure I'll answer exactly the question, but I'm going to try to answer something related to it. Um, one thing I think mattered and, and one of the puzzles for me was trying to understand why this sort of organizing and mobilization for buyouts took hold in Staten Island and didn't in, in places in South Brooklyn and Queens and other parts of the city that had, you know, kind of similar housing types, similar demographics, similar levels of storm damage, but didn't see the kind of, you know, public push for buyouts. And I think part of that is connected to how people viewed their identity, you know, maybe not so much as New Yorkers, but within the city and where they identified with. And so, you know, I remember reading a, a newspaper article after Sandy with someone from the Rockaways who was like, you know, where would I go to another part of Queens? I mean, that was very unthinkable. And just the identity was very tied to, to maybe Broad Channel or the neighborhood or Breezy Point or the place that you lived. And you lived in a place that was sort of unique in terms of your sense of collective identity, but really couldn't be sustained or imagined to be sustained outside of that, you know, sort of geographic space. Um, whereas in Staten Island, there's, you know, a very strong sense of borough-wide identity and, and being a Staten Islander, I think that's connected to the fact that it is the only borough with its own, you know, daily borough-wide newspaper, the Staten Island Advance. I think there is this kind of imagined community of Staten Islanders, even if there's, you know, quite a lot of division, very real divisions within that. But because of the topography of Staten Island, you could also move inland from these neighborhoods just by a few blocks and be at you know, a radically higher elevation 
Um, but there is a sense that you could move and not kind of lose that sense of identity or community that was tied to the borough as a whole um, in many ways. And, you know, another aspect of that kind of dominant Staten Island identity or sort of identity of Staten Islanders is this kind of civic pride and, and commitment to, you know, people people spoke about retreat as kind of the sacrifice for the greater good. That was language I heard. This idea of giving up your home to protect your neighbors further inland, it was a way of giving back to your broader community. It wasn't, you know, kind of selling out and abandoning it. Um, it was sacrificing your home to mother nature to protect people further inland. And, and people talked about how, you know, that's what Staten Islanders do all the time. This idea that it's a borough with a lot of kind of public servants and police officers and firefighters. And people would say, you know, we're the people that went into the towers on 9-11. You know, we, we kind of sacrifice ourselves for our community all the time. And that this kind of could fit into that sentiment and, and sense of identity too. I have a quick question. Um, I know that you are now based at a planning school, and I was curious to hear you comment a little bit on how the idea of managed retreat is being approached by sort of the urban planning and design community and how that might be different or similar to the way that social scientists or environmental scientists may approach the question. Oh, it's a good question. I feel like all of you are probably better placed to answer it in some ways. I'm still trying to figure out what it means to be in a planning school, <laughs> given that I have no training as one. Um, don't tell my colleagues. Um, but, you know, I think it's it's really a subject where in a sense, I feel like some, you know, I'm sure there are some kinds of disciplinary differences, but I feel like they've almost kind of fallen away. I feel like there is this kind of group of thinkers who are approaching managed retreat and in ways that just, you know, understand it as like an inherently and necessarily interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary kind of problem. And it is something that in many ways challenges you know, like climate change does, challenges the fundamentals and the preconceptions and kind of the received theories of a whole range of disciplines you know, urban planning, the social sciences, all of these, you know, social theories that just presume the environment is some kind of backdrop that's stable, similarly like planning cities. Um, and so I think managed retreat is exciting to study in a way because there are like, the approach to it is kind of still being worked out. And, and there's all these amazing spaces at Columbia University hosts this enormous managed retreat conference um, that they've done twice now. It's every other year that just brings together people from all over the place, you know, academia outside to, to think about the problems in retreat. And so it's kind of a field in formation. And, and so I don't know, yeah, there's, that's a good question. <laughs> um, could I ask a question myself too? Um, kind of related to Katie's question just now, you mentioned briefly in the talk that um, after the conversations around managed retreat emerged and kind of took off, there was kind of a shift in the planning and, and, and how the way this, the city um, started shifting towards redevelopment rather than kind of return to nature kind of rhetoric. And I was wondering how that was both justified by the planners and also how that was, well, I guess how that was received by the residents is probably like a whole different topic, but I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more on that aspect of the whole process. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And, you know, it was it was striking that, you know, when when residents started to getting together and saying we want buyouts, I sort of thought, oh, you know, these are places that have, you know, flooded repeatedly over the years, you actually have a moment where their residents are all coming together, many of them are coming together and saying buy us out. And it seems kind of obvious that that, you know, it's a big upfront investment, you know, buyouts are a huge upfront investment. Um, but it does, you know, if you look just kind of locally, it, it eliminates the risk, you know, as, as people who wanted buyouts were saying, like, you know, if my house isn't here, the federal government never needs, needs to pay out in flood insurance claims again, like taxpayers aren't on the hook for like the kind of disaster aid and response and all of that. And so, you know, there's kind of a compelling case for, for doing it. And it seemed like that initially to me, you know, I was spending a lot of time with people that were desperate to get buyouts and I was very sympathetic to that. Um, and, and so then to see, you know, the city, the city and increasingly the state in the face of just so many demands saying, you know, we're not going to buy it, you know, we're not going to retreat from New York City's waterfront. Mayor Bloomberg said, you know, as New Yorkers, we cannot and will not retreat. Um, you know, I think Chuck Schumer said, you know, rebuilding, like that's the spirit of New York, um, not retreat. 
And, and, you know, you see that quite often where you have local governments, even if they're, you know, our residents who want to be sponsored for buyouts, local governments who have to pay generally a 25% local match to the federal government for the cost of buyouts, they tend to resist any talk of them at all, you know, in part, because as I said, it threatens the tax base. Um, there, there's a lot of different reasons in New York City's case, you know, I think part of it is that, you know, part of it is that there was a lot of, um, enthusiasm for developing the waterfront, making it denser, ideas that you could make it much more quote unquote resilient. Residents did not like that idea. They did not like the idea of selling their land for redevelopment in part because they thought redevelopment had created a lot of the risk. And so they felt like, well, if me retreating is gonna contribute to making my neighbors safer, me selling my land for redevelopment could make people that stay more at risk. And I don't wanna feel part of that or part of contributing to risk of new people. Uh, many people also said, we don't want wealthy people to live here instead. You know, It's either gonna be made safe for us or, or forget it. Um, and so I think part of it was that kind of development pressure and just the sense that this was, you know, part of maybe New York City's last like kind of underdeveloped waterfront. There was a lot of redevelopment happening in the North Shore along the waterfront. Um, but the other, the other impetus, you know, from the city's perspective is that these are some of the last affordable homes you can buy in New York City. And, you know, you can buy them out. But that housing is not getting replaced elsewhere. You know, buyouts are just this kind of economic transaction that doesn't take into account where people might go or, you know, create new housing that they could possibly go to nearby. And, and many of the houses that were bought out were those kind of affordable homes that, you know, are now just gone. And, and so there was a real sense that that um, isn't, isn't a good solution. And the idea of, you know, even if you're kind of like seemingly reducing risk there, you're kind of creating more risks through reducing, you know, that that housing option and also depending where people go because there isn't you know a lot of support to see that they're able to get homes that are less at risk nearby um you know some of the follow-up research has found that a sizable proportion of people did just move to other flood zones um you know which were probably the homes they could afford um and and so that's it's a tricky thing so it makes a lot of sense that there is resistance to retreat and buyouts, um, you know, from the state's perspective, just setting that precedent of buying out a neighborhood. And then with the scale of climate change, it's like, where do you stop? And they really struggled with that, where one group would organize, the next block would be like, well, we want it too. And then the next block would say, we want it too. And it just kind of escalated so quickly. And, and so there's not a lot of, you know, it's a systemic problem and this is not a systemic kind of solution. And so it's, it's really challenging for policymakers to think about how to manage. Thank you so much. Um, I know we have like a hundred other questions, but we do have, we are um, out of time for now. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Kostov, again for this fascinating talk. Um, and then for those attending in person, I believe there's food waiting um, outside of the room as you walk out. So grab some um, as you walk out. But thank you so much again. Oh, thank you, Shoko. Thank you, Katie. Thanks everyone. I really appreciate you being here and tuning in.